We started a series this past week on the idea of being united. And we're looking at that idea of what is unity. And we're looking at it from the standpoint of not the unity of the world, but the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. And trying to understand then what that unique unity means then for my relationship with God. My relationship then that I have with my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And then what that relationship even means to those who are in the world. And we looked then last week, and there were two main ideas that we looked at. And the first is the idea of God's oneness. And that is His relational aspects in the Godhead. And we called that unity. That the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are continually glorifying each other. They have done that for all eternity. And that means, this idea of glorifying means to praise, to honor, to, to serve and defer to one another. Because the ultimate joy that they have is that they want the others to be in joy. And so we, we sort of talked about it from the standpoint of one revolving around another. And what we said is then thinking about it from the standpoint of it's actually the, the entire Godhead revolving around each other. We said then that is all three of them revolving around each other. And we said it looks in many ways, we might say like a dance. Revol these entities, these persons revolving around or orbiting each other. What we also said is that God created us for mutually self-giving, other-directed love. And what we meant by that is that really God made us for this dance. He made us to be part of this dance that has been going on for all eternity. That God's ultimate joy is for us to share in his joy, his love that he has experienced for all eternity. Today, though, we want to look then at sort of really how we messed up our ability to dance with God. And how God in his infinite wisdom, in his infinite mercy and grace has brought us back, if you will, He's brought us back to the dance floor and how we have been reunited. As we think about this, if we go back to the very beginning, to our creation, we see we had unity. That God created all things, and He created all things good. And when He did so, there was the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. But it means something even more than peace. It means this, this harmony, this interconnectedness. And everything was, was like that. It was, it was if we might even say that creation was dancing with God. God created humanity as the pinnacle of creation. And humanity's life centered on and revolved around God. And in the garden we see God and His divine space interconnected or overlapping man's space. Because as God was centered on man and man was centered on God, God dwelt with man. We're told that He would come and walk with man in the garden. And so we see this, this idea of this physical space of man, that is earth, interconnected with the divine space of God that is heaven. But as we are told in Genesis, we lost that unity. Man, humanity, chose to sin. God had said of this one tree in this garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of it. And God is saying, in essence, obey me about this tree 
because you love me. But in a way, we can define sin as centering your life and identity on anything but God. Man became stationary. Man became self-centered, saying, I want everyone else to revolve around me. In Genesis 3 and verse 6, we're told, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate. Rather than revolving around God, man made a choice to say, I want to do, define truth. I want to define reality by my own terms. I want God to revolve around me. And what happened, instead of a dance... There came a collision. Because think about it. If I'm wanting to be stationary and I want you all to revolve around me and you want to be stationary and you want me and everyone else to revolve around you, the reality is there's going to be a collision, not a dance. And it's a collision on a cosmic scale, if you will. Because we all try to get God to orbit around us. We say, it's about me. And when we, we become that self-centered, that stationary, our relationship with God unravels and all of our relationships unravel. Think about it. Self-centeredness creates psychological alienation. Meaning that if I am so focused on me, my needs, my wants, my ego, if that is all that I am, the reality is none of you want to be around me. We just don't like that. When somebody is so focused on themselves, we move away from that. So we alienate ourselves when we are so focused on ourselves. Think about the, just the social denigration that comes because of self-centeredness. Self-centeredness is at the heart of all the breakdowns of relationships between nations, between classes, between races, between individuals. You see, our choice to sin causes us our, to lose our ability to dance with God. We lost that unity and everything else broke. God removed us from His presence. And we live in disharmony with the universe. But thankfully, the story doesn't stop there. God has a plan. And He begins then at this point to unfold this plan to reunite us. And what that means is that we begin to see glimpses of the garden throughout the history, especially the history of Israel. Because God doesn't leave us in our collision, but begins to unfold this plan to bring us back into the divine dance. And so what we begin to see is all of these different places where heaven and earth overlap. For example, we're told in Genesis where Jacob has a dream. And the dream that he sees, this vision that he sees, is the, the angels descending the stairs and ascending the stairs back into heaven. At the top, there is Yahweh. And when Jacob wakes up, he says, I did not realize that the Lord is in this place. And the physical place where he was, he named it Bethel, meaning the gate of heaven. Moses and the burning bush. This bush that 
was on fire yet did not burn up. Moses comes to the bush and, and to investigate it, and God calls to him from the bush and says, Moses, Moses. He says, here I am. God says, take off your shoes because the place where you are is holy ground. What made it holy? God's presence. The, it, it, from being in the divine space, he came down and he was occupying that physical space. Heaven and earth overlapped there at the burning bush. And we see through Israel's history that the tabernacle and then the temple become that very idea of the place where heaven and earth intersect. That this is a place where man comes in contact with God and His presence. In Exodus chapter 29 and verse 42, there it says, It shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of meeting before Yahweh. There I will meet with you to speak to you there. I will meet there with the sons of Israel, and it shall be consecrated by my glory. God's saying, this is where we're going to connect. This is where divine and the physical intersect, is at the temple. And if you remember, a, a couple of months ago, we talked about how the temple and the tabernacle really are a reflection back to the garden. The temple points back to when God and man were in unity together. We could say that there's this three-tiered space. That you have the outer courtyard of the tabernacle and then the temple. And it relates to the, the area that God calls Eden itself. In the account of Genesis, we're told then that he makes a garden in Eden. We see that that corresponds to the holy place. And then we see that there is the holy of holies. The place, the, the hot spot, if you will, of God's presence corresponding to the middle of the garden where God was with man. As the story continues in Genesis, we're told that when man sins, God removes them from the garden and he places cherubim such that they guard the entrance to the tree of life. God told Moses when he's making the tabernacle and then when the temple is also built, he says, you put cherubim on the mercy seat. You put cherubim on the veil that is the dividing wall between the holy of holies and the holy place. You put cherubim on the veil or on the curtain that is on the outward side of things. Again, it's pointing back to the garden. Especially in the temple, Solomon would go and he, the walls were engraved with palm trees. And so it would be as you were a priest and you were walking into the temple, it's as if you're being pointed back to the garden, to Eden, when God and man were together, when heaven and earth overlapped. But the temple was only limited access to God. There was almost the idea of come close, but not too close. Because there was always the reminder of our failures, our self-centeredness, our impurity, and the need for one to mediate our interaction with God. But God continues to move towards us. If we fast forward now to the book of Isaiah... In Isaiah chapter 6, we're told that Isaiah has a vision and he comes into the Holy of Holies in the temple. He's not supposed to be there. He's not the high priest, and yet he's in this vision. He's there. He witnesses all of the glory and the grandeur of God. And his comment or, or, or his, his response to seeing all of this glory is, woe is me, I am ruined, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. God's response is not 
to remove Isaiah from the temple. Instead, he sends a seraphim to grab a coal from the altar of incense, and he takes it, and he brings it, and he touches Isaiah's lips. And the response that is given, it says, He touched my mouth, and with it said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. God's purity, God's holiness touches and is transferred to Isaiah. It is, in essence, healing him of his sin and impurity. We continue to move through the Old Testament. And we see in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 47, there is this picture that Ezekiel has of this grand temple. It's, it's, it's much larger and, and much more grandiose than, than anything that, that he has ever seen before. And in it, there is the presence of God. And what he sees then is in this temple, there becomes this this little trickle of water. And it flows out. And that, that little trickle becomes this mighty river that is now flowing and gushing out. And from it, it goes down into the Dead Sea. And what Ezekiel sees is that all things that are dead and barren, are coming to life. That this river is creating a garden. It's creating, it's bringing new life into all that it is touched by. Such that it says in Ezekiel 47 and verse 12, By the river on its banks, and on one side and on the other, will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, and their fruit will not fail. And they will bear every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. And their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. God's presence from this vision that Ezekiel sees is no longer that God's presence is contained only in the temple. It's this idea that his presence is going out into creation into our space so that he can bring humanity and all creation back into his life-giving presence. Now the question is left here, how is that going to happen? Who's going to do that? And for that we turn to the New Testament and we see a new human. That what we could not do on our own, God comes to do for us in human form. John tells us in John chapter 1 that Jesus took on our nature. John 1 and verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, God, came down and He took on flesh and bones and blood and organs and all that you and I are. And it says He dwelt among us. We've said before that word dwelt means tabernacled. That He is, he is coming here, is, here. He is the very essence of heaven and earth together. And he came to make known God to us. John 1 and verse 18, No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained Him. That's what He came to do. It's to show us, to to help us understand who this, this wonderful, almighty being is. He says, let me show you by how I live by how I talk, by how I act. To take it a step further, we see that Jesus came as the new embodiment of the temple. 
In chapter 2 of John, Jesus is there and he's talking with these, the people and, and he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the people all around him say, you can't do that. They think he's talking about the physical temple. They say, it, it, it took us 40 some or however many years to make this temple. You can't build it back in three days. To which John tells us he was referring to to his body. What does he mean there? He's saying that the temple now is not this, this physical place, but he himself is the place where heaven and earth come and intersect. He is the one who will take this holiness and bring it out into the world. Because as Jesus is the place where heaven and earth overlap, Jesus is that temple. But think about what he does. He goes and he touches lepers. He goes and he touches people who are unclean. He goes and he touches the dead. And what he is doing as he goes and he touches is he's... It's almost as if he's making little pockets of Eden in our sin-ravaged world. Because as he touches them, life comes back, whether it's, it's physical life in that the, the, the lepers are healed or it's, it's, it's breathing life in that the dead are raised. This is what Jesus is doing. The image of this one who is the connection of heaven and earth is bringing harmony in the midst of our brokenness. But the only way in which that is possible is for God, the Son, to die. The only way we can be re reunited to God is for Jesus to die. Notice in John 17... This is the prayer that Jesus is praying the night before he's crucified. And he's praying a number of different things, some of the things we looked at last week. But he now comes in his prayer and he says, Father, I don't pray for these only. I pray for all of those in the world who would believe on me. That means he's praying for you and me right now at that moment. And he goes on to say, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. I don't know a better way to sum up what we're talking about with unity than what Jesus prays right here. This is the dance. He's given us glory. His glory. He says, I've given it to them so that they can be with me, so that, that they can be one with me so that they may be perfected in unity. How does that happen? Ephesians 1 <clears throat> and verse 7 says, In Him, that is in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us. It took his death as the perfect Lamb of God, as our sacrifice so that we could be brought back into the dance. Consider how he did that. Tim Keller says it this way. Why did Jesus die for us? What was Jesus getting out of it? 
Remember, he already had a community of joy, glory, and love. He didn't need us. So what benefit did he derive from this? Not a thing. And that means that when he came into the world and died on the cross to deal with our sins, he was circling and serving us. I have given them the glory that you gave me. He began to do with us what he had been doing with the Father and the Spirit from all eternity. He centers upon us, loving us without benefit to him. Before you and I ever thought about God, Jesus says, let me come and revolve around you. The creator of the universe says, I want to circle my creation, not the other way around. That's what he has done for us. <clears throat> but he doesn't stop there. Because he unites all things. Our salvation in Jesus is vital to rejoining that dance, to being united together in him. But that's only part of God's plan. You see, God has a plan for the whole cosmos. In Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse 9, then it begins making known to us the mystery of his will, that, well, that which is God's plan. He's made it known to us, and according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Now notice this next part. To unite all things in him, in Jesus. Things in heaven and things on the earth. Our sin brought a brokenness, brought a, a fracturedness, if you will, to all the universe. We won't take the time to read it today, but in Romans 8, beginning there in verse 20, it talks about, Paul says, the creation is subjected to futility. That the creation itself groans, longing to be freed from corruption. And Paul connects that to the glory of the children of God. You see, in Jesus, the ultimate human, whose death and resurrection redeemed humanity from sin so that all who would come to him in trusting faith are joined to his life-transforming power. But notice this. He has also brought about the beginning of this uniting of heaven and earth. Heaven, all of the spiritual realm where the spiritual be beings who are for and against God, he has overcome. On earth, the realm of humans where people once separated from God who now have the opportunity to be brought back into this union. Jesus has begun uniting heaven and earth together again because he is king he is lord of heaven and earth you see we can't we can't talk about well what does unity mean to me and to you until we understand what kind of unity he's talking about that we're part of this grand scheme we're we're not we're not the focus point if you will in this we are part of this whole cosmos coming back into alignment with God. What are we to take away from this? Today, I just want you to see what God has done for us. That despite our failures, God has been moving towards us. He wants us reunited with Him. 
That this reunion is only possible through Jesus Christ, through what He gave up for us. Because He is the essence of the divine space and human space overlapping each other. This means that we're part of something bigger. We're part, because of Jesus' death, resurrection, and exaltation, we are part of this summing up, as the New American Standard uses, the uniting of this heaven and earth. So my question to you this morning is, are you reunited with Jesus? Is your life centered on God such that you make the choice to say, I am going to revolve around God. He is the center of my world. Because God has already said, I want to make you the center of my world so that we revolve around each other in a dance. Do you need God this morning? He is calling to you. If it may be that you need to become a child of God, giving up your old life, becoming a brand new creation through baptism, or maybe it's you just need prayers to say, I need to be reunited in a much stronger way than I ever have with Jesus. God offers that to you this morning. Won't you come as together we stand and sing?